Welcome to First Worship at First United Methodist Church of Florence. My name is Lisa Keys Matthews and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us together in worship. As we start our worship service, let me offer this prayer. Come Holy Spirit, quiet our minds and still our hearts so that may, we may fully experience your presence today. Almighty God, as we prepare with joy to celebrate the gift of the Christ child, embrace the earth with your glory and be for us a living hope in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me now as we open our hearts and we worship together. This is Luke 1, 26 through 38, the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of gathering this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Whether we realize it or not, we all live at the intersection of the human and the divine. Some might describe these two dimensions as the natural and the supernatural, while the Bible speaks to the realm of the flesh and the spirit. Most of us live as if the spiritual is secondary to the physical, disconnected to the other, or worse, null and void. When we're aware of the natural and the supernatural connection, the result is an experience that often blows our minds, delights our imaginations, and heightens our senses. This awareness is vital because it's at the intersection of the human and the divine where miracles happen. Even more impressive is that there are these miracles that happen in us, around us, and through us. Unfortunately, we miss out on these miracles because of the one-dimensional perspective that traps us. The result is a life of routine ordinariness and a lack of adventure. There's a more exciting life in store for us when we link our story with God's story. Martin Luther said there were three great miracles of the Nativity of Christ that God became a human being, that a virgin conceived, and that Mary believed. And of these three, Luther said the greatest miracle of all was that Mary believed. I wonder if Mary was the first virgin that Gabriel went to see. Is it possible there could have been others that God invited to bear his son, but who said no? If there were others before Mary and they said no, can we blame them? When presented with a divine opportunity, the risks can seem overwhelming. The risks were apparent to Mary as soon as the angel Gabriel left her. Her husband-to-be Joseph wanted to divorce her, and he would have except for another angel visiting him and explaining what was happening. The law did allow him to divorce her and even more to put her to death for an apparent sexual transgression. And most people assumed that that's what happened, but Joseph, thank God, saved Mary's life. And I'm sure that his defense of her brought shame to his family. There's a false belief that we're always safe when we're doing God's will. 
Although God's presence is a certainty when we do his will, our safety is not. Following God's will can involve significant risks. And there are countless examples of those who have given their lives in doing the will of God throughout our human history. Doing God's will can jeopardize the safety that we crave, not to mention the acceptance that we want from others. People may question our motives or even our sanity and shun us for following God's will. Life at the intersection of the human and the divine can be unnerving. Intersections are dangerous places. Many automobile accidents occur where the roads cross because you've got numerous vehicles moving in multiple directions and all the drivers have various thoughts and distractions going through their heads. The margin for error with all of those variables is tiny. And we can imagine all kinds of terrible things that can happen. Yet despite the danger, intersections are also a place of opportunity for we can turn and head in a new direction which will get us to a better destination. Intersections open new possibilities and this is no less true when we consider the confluence of the human and the divine. There's both opportunity and danger at the intersection of the human and the divine where miracles occur. What if Mary had said no? What if Mary decided that she didn't want God to be in control, and although she was willing for God to use her, it had to be on her terms? I'll tell you what would have happened. God would have found someone else to accomplish his will. How many times has that happened to us? Aren't we tired of God using other people? Don't we wish that we had the faith that allowed us to make more of a difference in this world? Will we keep on hoping and dreaming? Or will we venture into the intersection where the human and the divine converge to form a miracle? There are four ways to respond to God that will increase the chances of us getting to be a part of God's miraculous actions in the world. The first is to see where God is already at work in our lives. The story of Mary's faithfulness didn't begin on the day the angel Gabriel showed up in Nazareth. It started long before then, when, as a child, she listened to the stories of her faith and how her awesome God could do great things. We don't know much about her background other than she was a peasant girl who lived in a small town, but I feel certain that God had prepared her with his spirit to receive the visit of the angel on that day. God is at work in our lives too. Remember, we don't just live in the physical or the natural realm. There is a supernatural realm that is always at work around us. Let's begin to see where God is already at work in our lives and celebrate every little thing. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, says this in Ephesians, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God is at work preparing us for even greater things. By tapping into an awareness of the many ways that God is already interacting with us and shaping us, then we will increase our capacity to be faithful when God calls us to take a considerable risk in doing His will. Faithfulness doesn't just happen. It's developed over time. Besides seeing how God is already working in our lives, then we can also uh, look for and listen for God's direction. Gabriel brought a specific message to Mary that was both a blessing and a promise. 
Remember, the scripture says, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. Mary didn't modify or manipulate what the angel said. She didn't try to make the message more acceptable. She listened intently and absorbed everything Gabriel was telling her. God will not hide his will from us. Sometimes I hear people say, I just wish God would show me what he wants me to do. And they act as if God is, is withholding information from them. The reality is that God always reveals the next step he wants us to take. Now that doesn't mean that God will lay out the whole plan for us, but God has already revealed to us our next step. I think the reason that some of us have such a hard time determining God's will is that God has already told us what he wants us to do, and it wasn't what we wanted to hear. We continue to ask God, hoping that this time we'll get the answer we want. But we've got to trust that God knows what's best for us. And even though he may not call us to do what we want, and maybe even call us out of safety, he always calls us into his presence. Wherever God commands us to go, God goes with us. The psalmist put it this way, I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Mary was an intelligent person. When Gabriel laid out the plan that God had for her, Mary followed along sequentially until, that is, she remembered her fourth grade sex education. You know the part about what it takes to get pregnant? And here's the way Luke describes it. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. The way Mary responds to Gabriel is not, I can't have a baby. It's, how can I have a baby? It's not a negative statement or a refusal. It's a question of expectancy. If this is true, Mary wants to know, how is it going to happen? Gabriel tells her that it will be an act of God, an overshadowing of God's power through his Holy Spirit. And to emphasize God's supernatural power, he tells her some news about her cousin, Elizabeth. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Remember, Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. And in her old age, she experienced the intersection of the human and the divine when she became pregnant with the one who would pave the way for Jesus. Gabriel was, was expressing to Mary, you haven't seen anything yet. There's so much more to come because our God can do the miraculous. When God asks us to do something that borders on the impossible, a natural response is one of disbelief and refusal. But a supernatural response is one of faith and faithfulness. If God is only as big as the limits of our human reason, then we're going to miss out on some pretty big miracles. But if our God can do the impossible, then we're in for an adventure. But the fourth and final thing for us to do is to act in faith. Mary's response to the angel Gabriel is a model of what God wants from us. The scripture continues. 
Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then with his job done, it says, Then the angel departed from her. Are we servants in the kingdom of God, or are we merely bystanders watching God work through other people? Are we waiting for those other people to do God's will, or are we willing to make ourselves available to be used by God in powerful ways? It's either or. It's not both and. We've got to choose to act in faith. Mary chose faith and said, let it be with me according to your word. Erwin McManus tells about a time when he and his family were on vacation. He and his 10-year-old son were walking on the beach when they saw a man without legs. The man was trying to get up from the water back up onto the beach, but the sand made it difficult to do so on his crutches. As soon as he saw the man, Irwin's son took off and said, I've got to help him. Well, the little boy tried everything he could do, but his little body wasn't strong enough to, to really support the man and to get him where he needed to go. Finally, some other people came over and were able to support the man and, and got him to the spot he wanted to be. Irwin's son came back crying to his father and said, Daddy, I tried so hard to help him, but I just couldn't do it. Irwin assured him that, oh yes, he had helped, for he had unlocked the compassion in the hearts of those whose hearts were just moments before hardened to the plight of this man. The faithfulness of one can inspire many. God wants to do some great things here at Florence First United Methodist Church. God is not deterred by a pandemic. God is not limited by denominational uncertainty. God is not constrained by a country that is divided and falling in on itself. God is still able. And God wants us to continue to bring people into a relationship with Him and help them navigate the intersections of the human and the divine so that they can experience miracles in their lives. But to do so, we're going to have to risk everything and act in faith. We're going to have to listen to what God is calling us to do and then to be courageous enough to act. We can get on board or God will find someone else to accomplish His will. I don't want to miss out. How about you? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
his gospel is peace. Chain shall he break for the slave is my brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in Thank you for worshiping with us today. Go to fumcflo.org, that's fumcflo.org, and register your attendance. And now, let me offer this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Amen.